Welcome to The Culture Bar, a panel discussion podcast exploring, dissecting and shedding light on important topics in the arts and music world which matter to you. Hello and welcome to The Culture Bar. I'm Henry Southern and today we are taking a moment to have some COP26 reflections and we'll discuss the future of dialogue and cultural exchange in our climate conscious world. This is a big one and we couldn't have a more informed and charming panel to guide us through it. First up, Brandon Federer, Director of Global Community at Shared Studios. Samantha McShane, Head of Artistic Planning at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland. Rosanna Lewis, Creative Commissions and Culture and Development Lead at British Council. And last but by no means least, Lauren Livesey, Partnerships Manager at Curators. Thanks for being with us. Welcome everyone. Thank you Hi. for having us. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Thanks guys. So now to kick things off, um, I think it'll be wonderful to hear more about our panel and for you guys to introduce yourselves. And I'm going to come to you first, Rosanna, because um, what's brought us all together today uh, is the Brit a British Council initiative called the Creative Commissions, which we've all been involved with in, in various different capacities. Um, there are grants available to support projects uh, leading up to and during COP26 to explore, explore climate change through art, science and digital technology. Um, it's been quite extraordinary, but I ought to emphasise, of course, that this podcast is not just about how great those projects were and how wonderful the British Council was, which is rather, which of course, you know, the British Council is wonderful, but amongst other things, we want to you know, share learning from those experiences and, and talk about this topic more broadly. So anyway, Rosanna, I hope I've done that justice. Um, so now to kick things off, it would be wonderful to hear more about our panel and for you guys to introduce yourselves. So Rosanna, I'm coming to you first. Um, and you're part of the reason that's brought us all together with a, with a wonderful British Council initiative. Can you tell us more about that, please? Yeah, thanks, Henry. And um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, so my name's Rosanna. I lead on the Creative Commissions for the British Council. Um, and the British Council is all about building trust, understanding and connections between the UK and people around the world. And we do this through arts, education and the English language. And in the lead up to COP26, which most of you have heard about the Conference of Parties for Climate Change that happened in Glasgow last month, earlier this month actually, um, the British Council felt like we needed to look at the work that we were doing in our fields of speciality and develop a global programme that had resonance with people that we engage with and that was really going to make a difference in, to the world and try and tackle climate change in different ways. So we developed the Creative Commissions, which were awarded um, earlier this year. And there are 17 Creative Commissions that combine arts, science, and digital technology, uh, and address a range of climate themes from rising sea levels to deforestation and protection of biodiversity, and one of those projects was Climate Portals, which um, was led by Harrison Par in partnership with Shared Studio. So it's, I'm delighted to be here with you all today and to meet the rest of the team and to have this discussion. Thank you. And one of the other uh, wonderful partners for our Climate Portals project was also the Rural Conservatory of Scotland. We've got Samantha here from, from the Conservatory up in Glasgow. Samantha, can you tell us more about yourself and, and your role and, and, and more about around this topic? Absolutely. Thanks, Henry. Um, so I'm the Head of Artistic Planning at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. And at the RCS, we are a higher education institution primarily, and we have music, drama, dance, production and film all under our roof. Um, we also have a number of venues uh, within the building uh, and we put on various productions throughout the year, hundreds of productions actually throughout the year, um, for all of the disciplines that sit within it. So my job within the RCS is to um, lead on the artistic strategy with colleagues, particularly in the School of Music. So that involves programming um, orchestral performances, smaller ensembles, all of our performance series, working with any partners, professional partners that we have and masterclasses. And so talking about digital work and actually how the pandemic has, has kind of forced us to make a change um, is, is really sort of at the forefront of our mind right now and how we continue doing that. 
but as as we've said we are so lucky to have worked with Harrison Parrott, Shared Studios and the British Council and Scottish Ballet to have the portal outside our door and to see how that has opened up our ability to to work with people from around the world from all different backgrounds in order to inform our um, artwork and practice in general. Um, so really excited to talk through that with everyone here today. Thank you, Sandra. And please, listeners, indulge us just for a little bit longer about how wonderful our climate portal project and, of course, how wonderful the British Council is. Um, but it makes sense, I think, to segue to Brandon because with, without shared studios, this project wouldn't be possible because you provide the technology to realize these, these conversations. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me. And it's wonderful to be in conversation with such an incredible group and, and to talk more about the climate portals uh, and, and to talk more about, the, the as Samantha was saying, just uh, the future of digital technology and what that means for how we might engage one another around the world in, in effective conversation. Uh, I'm the director of global community for Shared Studios. Um, and Shared Studios really exists to bring people together from around the world, across distance and difference, for transformative conversations with the purpose of really creating a better world. Um, and that's a lofty goal, uh, but we do so in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is through virtual conversations, we call them journeys, uh, where we bring people together across enterprises, education, and arts and cultural institutions to have transformative conversations uh, about all sorts of pressing global issues, climate being one of them. Uh, and the other, which I think we've touched on a bit here already, is through portals, which are immersive spaces uh, where uh, it's a repurposed shipping container. When you step inside, you're in a full body face-to-face -face conversation with someone uh, in a similar container in one of 25 countries around the world. Uh, and we've been so happy to have been a part of the climate portals um, and partners with both Harrison Parrott, the British Council, and especially the Royal Conservatoire. Uh, they've been a, a delight to work with and, and really uh, allowing us to, to understand the ways that we can use this technology and art uh, to create more impactful conversations about climate issues. So uh, happy to be here and to continue that conversation. Thank you, Brandon. Um... Yeah, I can, there's lots to unpack here already. I can see with Samantha, you were talking about all the wonderful live programming you're doing, Brandon with the future of digital technology. And we're, we're going to move on from climate portals now. We're going to go to another creative commission, a fantastic guest here, Lauren from Curators, who did a project called Museum of Plastic. And I mean, digital technology is what all you're all about, creating these immersive experiences. Is that right? That's correct. Um, I'm Lauren and I'm also very happy to be here and join this wonderful panel. Um, my background is museums. I work for Curators, um, which is part of Cooperative Innovations. They're an immersive tech studio and um, we have put together Curators, which is a platform for social, cultural, virtual tours of museums and cultural spaces. Um, and the really important thing there is that they can be accessed on uh, smartphone, tablet, laptop or a VR headset so that you know we, we acknowledge digital poverty is, is a real issue but we want to make conversations that happen in a digital space be as accessible as possible for as many people as possible. Uh, the platform launched early this month but the way that we intersect with, um, with the, the British Council's climate commissions is that they uh, very very kindly supported us with um, through their program to put together something that we've called the Museum of Plastic 2121 it's a speculative museum of the future set 100 years from now with a, um, a world that's being explained. So the Museum of Plastic 2121 is a speculative museum of the future set 100 years from now, which aims to explain to the people of that time what single use plastics were, how they came to be such a huge part of the uh, 20th and 21st centuries, why anyone thought they were a good idea, and how we came to really have a sea change in our behaviour and reliance on them. Um, that launched um, earlier this month, but it features um, uh, partners from South Africa, um, the artist collective Green Pop, uh, uh, the artist collective Bazart, and the um, NGO Green Pop, and uh, researchers and academics from across the globe as part of the University of Hull's Circular Plastics Collaboratory. Um, but it has been um, up for a few weeks now, and it's available to download on um, Oculus and Steam. So I have to put in that uh, that little plug there. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to kind of be part of this this panel of discussion today. Plugs are all welcome, no problem. 
Um, and I look forward to checking that out. Thank you very much. Now, one of the things which you mentioned, I wasn't expecting to get this deep this quickly, but we're going to dive, dive straight in. You guys don't mind, I can tell. Digital poverty, accessibility. I think that's really fascinating because it's all very well us saying the future of dialogue and cultural exchange is on digital, but actually in the UK and worldwide, there's specific, not everyone has the latest iPad or smartphone, whatever it might be. And, and how, can, how are you tackling that? Um, so within um, kind of curators, the, the meat of the platform, the, the tech magic that I can't begin to understand because I'm a museums person, not a tech person, um, is being able to create a digital space that is accessible in the same way, no matter how you access it, whether that is on a really expensive VR headset for a full body immersive experience, or whether you're coming in on a really, really cheap um, kind of tablet or laptop so you know absolutely there's an acknowledgement there that not everybody has got access to even this level of digital kit um, but we do feel that by continuing to push the envelope by making the technology um, usable accessible on all different platforms all different types of hardware you continue to push um, the boundary of, of who can be included and to kind of make it more difficult for people to not include others so if you can do something digitally if you can bring in somebody on a really cheap sub 100 pound tablet or laptop and you choose not to do that and to meet uh, physically in a way that would exclude anybody who couldn't afford airfare etc you really have to ask questions about the decision that you've made to do that so it is an ongoing problem and not something that we've got the answers to right now um, but I think it's something that's really important to acknowledge within the, the tech industry. Um, not everybody can, can have that access, but to state what you as an organization are doing to try and ameliorate that as much as is possible. So actually in some ways, the barriers of entry from a financial point of view are less than say, as you say, a flight, for example, and all the other things that go around it. Absolutely. Um, you know, in the vast majority of instances, international airfare is going to come to significantly more than, you know, access to uh, a tablet or laptop. So that's an investment that can um, lead to long term continued and sustained dialogue. I think the sustainability in terms of something happening, not just once, but continuing and being um, having a real legacy that can grow and develop is, is really important there. That's a very good point. Rosanna, the British Council do anything to address this? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is digital poverty is a topic that has come up a lot in our work. We're about international collaboration, connection. Um, so we really have to think about how can we connect online or remotely, especially in the world of COVID today, where international travel is less possible. Uh, and with the climate change issues that we're facing, we're also trying to limit our carbon footprint across the organisation. So with the creative commissions, what I love about them is that they all bring something really unique and different. And the Curators Project Museum of Plastic um, and Climate Portals do rely heavily on digital to have that interaction and that connection. But you're also through Climate Portals, and I'm sure Brandon can say more, uh, by providing that shipping container space around the world, you're also giving communities who don't have digital access access to a platform but what we've tried to do across the 17 is have a real range of opportunities to engage so that it's not all digital facing that there is community workshops and activities happening in some of the projects that are then platformed on digital platforms but um, that that's not the primary purpose of the activity and the, the creative process that they're going through in that project an example of this is listening to ice which has sent some sound recording devices to a glacier in the himalayas and worked with local communities to listen to the sound of the melting glacier and to better understand in their community what it means to them uh, if their glacier disappears what does the ecology look like uh, what's the effect on flooding further down um, in in the himalayas how are they aware of it and what stories and even songs have emerged from their relationship to frost to snow to their landscape um, and a documentary will be created as well as a record of um, songs from from the local community 
that will go beyond the lifetime of the project and, and be some a legacy for them as well as an experience they've had that isn't digital but still has a digital reach beyond the project itself wow that's fascinating i never would have thought of something like that and one of the things which which i found personally found quite challenging with this brief and actually as we approach more programming going forward is how you can credibly marry the arts with say climate change or other themes such within the arts science and digital technology um but samantha how have you found that at the conservatoire yeah it's it's really interesting because when the the portal first came or we first started speaking about the the portal initially we were thinking okay what performances can we have within the portal to you know share with people from around the world and actually what has been and is in line with what Rosanna's just been saying, what has been um, just so fruitful is having basic human interaction in the portal. It might be on a really basic level. One instance was of a student speaking about their love of coffee, where it's produced, what is the shipping process, what is the, you know, everything around something like food and just having that basic conversation taking it and then creating artwork from it and not only that the artwork is shared with everyone locally so it's almost like um you know you're connecting globally in order to make that impact locally and what we're trying to do then what we're then trying to do is to you know motivate people in our local communities to realise what's going on, on around the world and what the impact is, the true impact of, of some countries that climate change is happening because some of us are fortunate enough to, you know, not be so aware of all of that because it doesn't have a direct impact. So it's about using the art and, and, and the artwork that we create to tell that story, I think. Yeah. And, and Brandon, I mean, we've, we mentioned this uh, with, with the others just, just now, but, um, one of the extraordinary things about the portals is its locations around the world in a Uganda refugee camp or in a tech hub in Gaza and in many ways that that does reduce barriers it allows anyone and everyone to have those conversations right yeah I think something that that is emerging here is uh that when it comes to digital poverty is it's not just about how how do we connect communities but it's who are those communities uh who are the people that we're connecting and and the the work that shared studios does and, and a commitment that we have is it, whether it's in the the immersive space of the portal or even in a, a virtual conversation uh is really to highlight the voices of those folks who are generally not the ones who are are getting hurt um so whether that be uh climate activists from uh nakavali in uganda who aren't able to attend cop uh, but have a lot of things to say about the way that the, the current climate crisis is impacting their communities. Uh, or like you mentioned, Henry, uh, a tech hub in Gaza, uh, which is a place where a lot of people may not have the opportunity to travel. Um, and so uh, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a poverty here, a digital poverty in terms of the kind of ways that we uh, can provide internet and digital access to communities, but there's also kind of a human poverty here in that we're only hearing from the same people again and again and again. So to to Samantha's uh, point, um, you know, being able to, to connect to these communities and just engage one another at a very human level, just around coffee. You know, we used to start portals with the simple prompt of what would make a good day for you. Uh, and you realize just how much you have in common with people around the world but it also inspires different forms of connection that I love to hear, you know, are, ins are inspiring forms of art that then live in the local communities, but are grounded in this global context is, is really fantastic. So that actually raised an interesting point. So how, you, know, you said by starting with something uh, quite human. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you all was, how can we kind of elevate the digital and virtual experience and Brandon, you and I spoke before about having grounding it in just something, uh, yeah, quite normal, and then to build from there. And, and I think you've you found that to be particularly effective. Yeah, I think even so, it, it works in in the immersive space of the portal. But I think that it's equally as important in our virtual interactions uh, as well. Whether that be a meeting that we're having with colleagues over Zoom, or whether it be you know a conversational journey that Shared Studios is putting together for an enterprise. 
it, you always have to create an atmosphere for human connection. And when we're specifically in the virtual space, it's really difficult for us to connect human to human because I've got my notes open on this side of my computer. I've got my email pinging in the back. Uh, and so it takes a bit more care and, and thought to create moments where we just start to get to know one another in the beginning and start to understand, you know, uh, I love coffee. Oh, to, oh, you know where some is produced. Oh, that's fantastic. Let's, uh, you know, that creates an atmosphere for us to remain connected. The beauty of the portal is it does a lot of that work for you. You're standing full body face to face. And so you're able to kind of dive into things more, uh, more quickly. But I think in, in terms of digital technologies in general, we need to be thinking a lot more about and, and really pushing to be more thoughtful about how we engage the human rather than, rather than and I, I'm really interested actually to hear from Lauren on this, uh, you know, how do we center the human in digital, uh, in digital interactions as opposed to the technology, even though the technology is essentially what's enabling us to have that interaction in the first place. Absolutely, Lauren, take it away. What a great setup. Thank you, um, Brandon. No, it's everything that I've been hearing has just been chiming on so many different levels, um, but certainly the, the ability to have a conversation with somebody and the, that's the thing about climate portals you see somebody's you know you see the whites of their eyes you can absolutely have that conversation when you move into a digital space with a digital avatar do you have that same level of connection well obviously my stance very much is yes that is still absolutely available you know it's been great to track the development of the creators platform as we've, we've moved it along when you're in a space you're a digital avatar a kind of spongy humanoid looking shape collection of kind of um of shapes but it's it's a it's something that has personality and interest um and when we were able to kind of add the functionality of being able to raise your hand or being able to wave or being able to um, kind of cheer or do anything that moment that we were able to integrate that just simple way of making uh making some kind of behavioral gesture that the kind of authenticity and the enjoyment of being in that space absolutely skyrocketed. So I think being able to inhabit a space with somebody physically, inhabit a space with somebody digitally where you can see them, there's a real strength there. Um, but I also think that there's really something to be said for inhabiting a space with somebody in a non humanoid form almost being able to see somebody where you're all just a connection of a collection of polygons you can all be in a space you can set aside any ideas that you might have around people backgrounds appearances any of those things and just have a conversation with somebody um, and i think that's something that we've been really enjoying getting to do within within the museum of plastics the idea is that somebody in iceland on an oculus headset can join somebody in um, buenos aires on a tablet with somebody in papua new guinea on a smartphone you know you can all join together at the same time you might do that intentionally you might do that completely accidentally but that accident of digital proximity i think creates a really really fertile space for discussion and imagination and when you're able to bring in stewards of the space whether that's a curator whether that's an expert who can lead a tour who can spark imagination and ask a question or answer a question from the audience that maybe just pivots the way you're seeing things in a slightly different way i think those opportunities for discussion that are filtered through different perspectives different life experiences is what's absolutely so fertile and interesting absolutely yeah it's fascinating i mean Rosanna, I don't suppose with other projects you come across, have there been examples where the, the digital interaction um, has been elevated onto, yeah, to another level that we haven't previously, or it's been surprising to you and perhaps been particularly successful? Yeah, I mean, definitely the Museum of Plastics is, is probably the example where that digital interaction is in that VR space, but we also have another project called Green Spaces Atlas, which um, is capturing green urban spaces in Botswana and working with local communities to develop a creative green space in their urban communities. And they're working with the local authorities and, and decision makers to make those spaces actually happen in reality. But they're creating a VR and 3D experience um, of what that space would look like if it were there. And I think, beautifying and, and making spaces green in this way creates that sense of imagination and possibility 
the, in the climate change space, the hope behind those projects is really key that people don't lose sight of what is possible. And I think when Museum of Plastic, it's quite similar. It's rather than saying, look at how terribly we treated our planet and all the plastic that's around and that we've never been able to get rid of in a hundred years. It's saying, what, how can we sh show a different reality of a more healthy evolution in humanity of our relationship with plastic and look back at it in a, in a way to say, yes, it was part of our history, but we've changed and we've managed to evolve and we have a, a, a very different relationship with it now. And it's sitting in a museum, which I think is the really um, fun and creative side of Museum of Plastic, creating that virtual space. Um, so yeah, that there are those are the kind of most digitally evolved, I'd say. But what I found really interesting about what Lauren was talking about is the different ways people can interact, whether it's accidentally or purposefully. Um, and also, I think with climate portals just the experience of the people involved in the creative process, not just in the portal, but without and within their communities going, sort of taking the project and that experience beyond the actual digital platform um, is something that I find really fascinating from a project management creative commissions perspective. Yeah, there's certainly an extraordinary amount of activity out there to as you say, you call it a digital evolution or the, the, how digital has evolved and it's um, amazing how it's enabling interaction. Samantha, I, I wonder if there are any other experiences you can share from your work with the Conservatory, but also, let's face it, right, I'm asking a flippant question here. It doesn't beat live performance or in-person interaction. You can do what you like with digital, but it's never going to beat it, right? Um, well, hmm. <laughs> uh, I think that yeah it depends on what kind of cultural interaction and exchange we're we're talking about so if i'm thinking right now from a perspective of where we're at in terms of technology and its accessibility i don't think that having musicians here in glasgow playing alongside musicians in rwanda for example would be the best way to interact with each other and, and expecting it all to work well. I think, yes, in a room with each other, that, that is the best way forward. However, everything, you know, everything does have a cost, doesn't it? And, you know, the, the, the cost, the financial cost of making that happen, the, the, the cost to the climate and, and the time as well involved in doing that. And so I think that when we, when we talk about cultural exchange, we just have to adapt the way that we think about it. So instead of thinking that traditionally we're all supposed to be in one room, let's come away from that. Let's start it online and then take it from there and see what's possible from there. Um, I think the pandemic, has, as, as I was saying before, has absolutely helped us to, to begin um, working in new ways. I really hope that in the future that um, VR will become much more accessible, um, you know, and I hope that we're able to use it within within the RCS and other higher ed education institutions. I remember, I think it was years ago now, where the Philharmonia had set up their uh, VR, you know, experience within the orchestra. The virtual and orchestra, yeah. The virtual orchestra, exactly. And so I hope that VR will go even further in the future so that if, for example, um, at the moment we might do masterclasses with someone in Australia over Zoom, it works well, we've got the setup now to make it work, but imagine what it would be like if they're both sitting with VR headsets on and they feel like they're there together. Um, so I think that's all, I feel like that's all to come. Absolutely. I mean, with VR, we're, we're just the tip of the iceberg. We've got these big, chunky headsets now. I mean, think of what a mobile phone was like in the 80s. They were massive. And look at them now. So we're only, the only way is it's going to get smaller and, and uh, more subtle and more, more immersive. But um, Brandon, what do you think of my flippant comment that you can't, you can't beat live, right? You can't beat in person. Uh, I, I, just building off of, of what Samantha said, I think one of the important things there is that it, it's... It, when we are limited to just being in the same room, we're also limited to the types of people who we can interact with in that room. 
and the digital opens up an opportunity for us to engage people who are from uh, areas we may never go visit, um, from uh, communities that we may never have had access to, to learn things about their culture that we may not have ever learned. Uh, I think it's really exploded our ability to engage in productive cultural exchange. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's inviting new people into, into that room because it's a digital room. Uh, I also am interested in the, the ideas of, of VR. One of the things that I think is, is really impactful about the portal and is that it, it grounds the, each participant in the physical space of their own community. Um, while simultaneously engaging the space of the community in the other country where they're speaking. And then it creates a third space where these two things merge together in the confines of the shipping container. And I really see the future of digital technologies as being less VR focused and more AR focused. Um, imagine to go back to Samantha's example, we're doing a cooking class, but I'm in my kitchen and I can see my kitchen as well as see the kitchen of the other person without having to, to put on a headset. And, and I think eventually we'll get there where the, the, the VR and the AR will kind of come together and, and will no longer be uh, limited to those headsets and the complete divorce of our bodies from our own physical space, but it'll be a merging of the physical and the digital that I think is most exciting. Absolutely. So it's very exciting about the, the potential. And, and it's interesting what you're saying about it. We were talking about digital poverty earlier, and that's the diversity and inclusivity discussion. But actually, you're right. You are just limited to the people in the same room. And you're, you've got so many other possibilities when, when you enter into the digital world. Um, Lauren, I'm sure you've got lots to, to unpack about this, and particularly also with the VIR discussion as well. Yeah, I mean, so many things that are being said here are just so fascinating. I think we could probably all just sit down and talk for hours on any one of the, the kind of things that come up. But the kind of the conversation about, you know, will the digital ever kind of supplant or replace the physical connection? I don't think it will. Um, I don't think that that's not something that I think curators is designed to do, but I think it's there to supplement and to extend connection. If we limit ourselves to only connecting with one another when we can physically be in a room, then absolutely, that room has got very few voices in and it's often going to be the same voices and the same type of people. If you are having a conversation about a global, something with a global impact like the climate emergency and you're only preferencing voices from the, you know, the global north and you're in, not including the global south, that's not a conversation of the parties. That's a conversation of a few people who are very often, as I think um, Samantha or Rosanna mentioned earlier, not the people at the sharp end of the problem. Um, and I think that's what is so interesting and, and, and central about uh, digital ways of, of connecting. We don't have the excuse to keep ignoring people and leaving them behind if we can offer a climate portal in um, you know, a, a, my, a Polynesian island, or we can include access to the Museum of Plastic to somebody in um, low-lying parts of Southeast Asia, and we choose not to do it, then we have to make our peace with the fact that we are making a decision not to engage with people. Um, and I think that is what is um, really gonna be an interesting shift as we embed the digital because we have to come to terms with the people we choose to speak with and that sometimes maybe we're going to hear conversations points of view perspectives that don't reflect all that well on us but are absolutely vital to hear yeah, yeah absolutely i mean global conversations is what the british council is all about though right Bethany? yeah exactly um i mean it's such a joy to hear all of you speak about the, these topics because it's so in line with what we do and also you know the way that i the values that i live by and, and believe in as well um what we've really tried to do with creative commissions is ensure that each project is in partnership with an organization from what we call an official development assistance country so in sort of the formal policy terms a developing country that um, that can benefit from that international connection with the UK, but also that the UK benefits from the connection that's made with that country. And what was really important to us is that um, these projects platform the voices of people with lived experience 
and people that are actually in those countries and in those contexts that are looking for local solutions that work for them based on their needs um, so that we're not coming in and um, you know um, parachuting in and taking control and having a conversation that we want to have with with people but actually we're listening to their needs and what they want to be doing on the ground and partnering and connecting people so that they're able to make that happen uh, so that was really important to us with the creative commissions and, and in all of our work in the British Council is to for that connection to be mutual of mutual benefit and um, and to platform as many voices as possible so that we are being inclusive that we are listening and eventually building that trust and understanding and it's not a given um, we can't just assume that these relationships will happen on their own uh, language is another big barrier and some of our projects um, like living language land have really had to work with intermediaries to be able to connect with communities and understand what words they would choose to highlight ahead of COP26 that show the connection between them and nature and their ways of living um, and that requires a, a a trust and a relationship that is already there and that can be fostered and that can be sustained um, so all of these projects we're hoping will have a life beyond COP and that COP26 yes it's a moment in time that's really key and really crucial to get right now um, but we have commitments and we have um, a duty to the planet beyond our, our jobs beyond policies you know in our day-to-day -day. and it's a topic that connects us all because we're all interconnected through the different channels that um you know just through the weather itself but also uh nature and the systems that we've put in place that that are creating the climate emergency that we're currently living yeah that what what's really fascinating to me listening to all of you speak is the emergence of of kind of uh, a few key things uh, this idea of accountability um lauren that you you were really driving home is if uh, now that we have the technology that's enabled us to communicate with people who who might not otherwise be in the room if those people are not in the room then we have to be accountable for why that is because we no longer have the excuse of oh well we can't get them in the room uh and then this this connection rosanna as you were talking about uh, lived experience and really understanding people from the experiences of their own lives, their own communities, and 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 starting from that place as opposed to I think we particularly when it comes to issues like the climate crisis, we have a tendency to immediately jump into what are the policies that need to be passed, what are the things that the developed world needs to do, what do we and and if we really just start from let's start with a story from someone who's you know experiencing food shortages in Zimbabwe. I think there's an incredible climate activist, Elizabeth Gulu Gulu uh, from Zimbabwe. Start with her story, and then you might get a better understanding of what policies need need to happen. And by hearing that story and allowing that story into the room, it circles back to this idea of accountability. Now you're accountable to that story, and you're accountable to that person in the room. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, the conversations we've had with climate portals, they were so hearing people from on the ground, as you guys were saying earlier, was they were so insightful and, and, and humbling and that element of also reciprocal exchange was, was really important but Lauren I think you've got something to add towards this no I mean I absolutely agree with everything that Brandon was saying there and I think the point he was raising about starting with stories starting with people is just absolutely integral you know the, the work that my career is as, as the work that I've done in my career predominantly within museums I see museums as a space to tell stories stories about who we are why we think we are a certain way why we the stories that we choose to tell and who we choose to tell them about um and i think that is you know to, to kind of come back a little bit to the the, the topic of this conversation and this podcast is you know why what can the arts add what can an artistic um response to any issue really add is where do the arts come into the climate conversation well where don't they would be my response you know an artist in the way that an artist, whether that's a filmmaker, a musician, a photographer, a writer, the way that they see distill 
and articulate these issues, particularly issues that are so global and so, you know, that affect everybody so much. The distillation of that experience, I think, is absolutely vital. And if the digital can uplift that, enable that, um, that distillation to reach more people, then it's absolutely a huge string to our bow. And that's why the work that something like the British Council do is so, so hugely important. I've encountered so many people in, in the work that I've done in, in the arts and literature who kind of go, this this isn't this isn't your space this isn't about you this is about policymakers this is about economics this is about finance maybe on some level it is but for a very long time the people who it has been about haven't necessarily done a huge amount and the space that is provided when an artist from south africa like the ones who are working with the museum of plastics when a musician um, you know the, some of the first nations musicians who were were, were speaking out around um, cop 26 when you hear those views i think it can it can give you an understanding that you would never have been able to get through a few kind of bold faces bold um pages of policy and that is the human connection that can be you know it, that is absolutely vital in this discussion yeah and uh, i don't know who you're speaking to but you know culture has uh, inspired policy in our society for hundreds of years and continues to do so i mean Samantha, i'm sure you agree with that and and it'd be fascinating to get your insight on in how the arts has played an advocacy role and can play a hugely influential role in our society. Yeah, I think that um, going back to the pandemic and everyone was thinking, OK, how can we share what we do on a global level? And, I'd, you know, there was so much amazing artistic content that reflects all of the sort of global challenges that we face on Earth right now. Um, and, and that was fantastic. However, I think we'll all we all kind of um, have heard people saying, especially recently, oh, if I have to watch one more you know, online concert again, then, you know, I just I just don't know if I can take it. There was too much almost online. And so. I think the role of the artist is the digital, you know, it's their role as an artist to learn more, to hear those stories, to take that on a digital level. And then it's kind of similar to what I was saying before, and then spread that on a, on a local level as well. I think the power and the emotion that any of the arts can evoke in, in people is more powerful than anything, as you say, who, would want to sit and read through pages and pages of policy when actually you can get a much more powerful message from from whatever uh, genre of art it is. Um, and I think, you know, the, the arts is constantly every day evolving and changing itself. But at the RCS, as we see students come through, students who are super passionate about the climate emergency and uh, climate change, they, you know, now so not so many of them want to traditionally go into an orchestral role and sit be playing music by dead composers a lot of the time. Actually, now they want to be creating their own work about all of these challenges that we're facing. Um, and I think, you know, that the, the next generation of artists are key in keeping the arts alive through telling those stories um, and making change globally as well. So exciting to see what they come up with and uh, it's, it's, it's also creating those credible responses as well. Um, it's, uh, it's really fascinating. The arts and culture can really translate data, the climate change data that is coming through and the policies into something that is more relatable and understandable for people. Um, and one of the Creative Commission's Nine Earths really does that by um, capturing quotes and um, stats about the, the climate emergency and the effects on the world and um, translating that into an immersive experience of film and music uh, in a space where you can watch people walking around in their daily lives and talking about their carbon footprint as alongside the hard stats around climate change um, that, that have come out and emerged through IPCC reports um, and some of the conversations around COP26. So I think art and culture can also have play that role in translating 
hard data that is scientific and very difficult for policymakers and scientists to get across to a wider audience. That's a really good point. The arts can make those sort of things far more approachable and far more entertaining and, and far more impactful. Um, now then, just as we come to a close, the last few minutes, we, we were, the title of this podcast was also about COP26 reflections and we've I think we've all reflected that there's no need to travel quite so much there's digital can still be just as impactful if, if not more so sometimes but i wanted to ask you guys what's next what's the future of, of digital technology and interaction i mean dare i say if it's not digital and if it's not live is there something else which we're, which we're not thinking about what what do you think what's your crystal ball telling you um Brandon, I'm going to come to you first. Oh, fantastic. Throw it to me first. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think I'll echo something that I said earlier. I really think the future of, of digital is in the layering of realities, um, or maybe that's the, the world I want to live in. Uh, I want to be able to, to feel the comfort of being in my community around the people who are like me. Um, while still having an opportunity to interact with others who may be very different from me and understand their cultural context as well. Um, this sharing of space, I think that's really what was uh, central to the idea of the, the portals in the first place when uh, Amar Bakshi first uh, kind of thought of the idea and, and put a portal between New York and Tehran is, is sharing space with someone different than yourself. Um, and I, I, I hope that, that as digital evolves, it finds uh, we find more and more effective ways of sharing space with people who are different than than ourselves. That's really my hope for for digital technologies, regardless of what they what they look like. Absolutely, that's very inspiring. Samantha, what are your thoughts? Um, very similar, actually, around uh, AR. Um, I mean, I've watched so many series and films where you know, they explore what it might look like in, in 50 years time and felt incredibly scared by the prospect of, you know, all of the, the, the data that's shared and how vulnerable actually it makes us all. And will we all start to, will human interaction be as important then? And I, whatever it is, I just, and I, and I really, I, I know that this will be the case, but I really just hope that that basic human interaction is still as as special as it always has been. Um, I hope that for, you know, in the world of music, that we are able to share performances with, you know, some kind of headset where it feels like you're at a festival, you're there at the live gig, but you don't have to travel. Um, but I think, yeah, basically it's all around um, AR. Um, it's exciting, but also quite scary as well. Absolutely. Or well, watch this space. Rosanna, the British Council, have you got any, any exciting things coming up that we should watch out for in this area? Well, we've, we did a digital collaboration fund last year, and this year we've just launched an international collaboration fund and in the process of selecting those projects. But I think what's really key is that the any digital connection um, really builds that empathy that Brendan Braddon was talking about around understanding cultural contexts and people and their stories and their their needs, their wishes, their desires, um, and having that human connection, but also connecting on some of these global challenges like climate change and looking at innovative solutions and uh, creative ways to respond to the world around us. Uh, one of my fears, though, I think I share with Samantha, is around currently the digital space not necessarily being very safe, um, a, a lack of understanding of where our data is being stored, who's responsible for it, how it's being used. Um, so I would like to see a reduction in, um, digital, in our digital footprint as well for kind of environmental reasons and also a safer space for people to interact and gather that is open and not restricted where in, in some countries and contexts, there's not that digital freedom that we experience um, here in the UK, for example. Wow, that's, I mean, that's a podcast in itself, the future of you know, data and our digital footprint. We'll come back to you on that one for sure. 
But Lauren, can you finish us off with, uh, I'm sure, something inspiring and exciting about what the future holds? No pressure. Oh gosh. <laughs> no, no pressure at all. I mean, I've just been trying to marshal some of my thoughts while listening to all these incredible um, kind of um, points of view here. And um, I think one of the things that's interesting is the pace of change. You know, if you look back 30, 40 years, did we think we'd be walking around with little supercomputers in our pockets that can connect us to anybody anywhere in the world where I can order food for three days time where I can turn on my heating from the other side of the country or, you know I think some of the changes that are going to come along are stuff that we can't even begin to conceive of right now um, and that's really exciting but as you know as Rosanna says there are there are some one more worrying elements that I think we really need to continue thinking about and not, not just hold up digital as, as the be all and end all that will answer everybody's everybody's questions and fears uh, and to continue doing work digitally um, as part of international collaboration and in a way that isn't just one-off projects you know the British Council very much um, invests in sustained legacy to make something not just be a one and done but to acknowledge that conversations progress and they take time and building trust and bringing in different perspectives is not a one-off um, exercise but I think as we continue to make a digital world um, and at the moment you know post-pandemic we are really kind of developing best practice as to how we're going to keep doing things you know we all got used to using zoom and, and putting ourselves on a mute and you know if a kid walks in or if your dog walks in you have to show the dog as the dog tax you know that kind of these little things that we've got used to doing we need to set up a best practice for using digital in the world and we need to not gatekeep we need to make sure that we're providing the same opportunities to as many people as we possibly can and if there are instances wherein we don't currently have a way to provide that opportunity we don't just shrug and go oh that's too too bad we find ways to to extend um, the opportunity for conversation because that's the way we get anywhere i think well thanks for that lauren and many thanks again to all our wonderful panelists brandon samantha rosanna and lauren thank you also to holly gedge Fiona Livingston and our sound editor Merlin Thomas. Our theme music is composed by Robert Cochran. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. If you haven't done so already, be sure to check out all the other wonderful episodes from The Culture Bar with topics ranging from race and the civic responsibility of the arts to how the arts can respond to the climate emergency. We've had one-on-ones with MPs, we've had chinwags with members of the House of Lords and natters with cultural leaders and inspiring artists. To get all that and more, please subscribe. See you soon.